I don't know where even to start today. Should, should we go ahead and go to Joel, Joel? Let's start in Joel, chapter 2. Um, I just got to have a text, and that's a good, as good as anything. The Holy Spirit, it's interesting. Pastor Mike sent um, a uh, little video uh, to myself and Pastor Lisa. It was to us together, wasn't it? Or was it just to me? I don't remember. Um, it was one of us. But it was just it was it was a little TikTok, a little video of of a man saying saying I know TikToks are supposed to be fun and and all that kind of stuff. But he said I got a word that I need to let you guys know, and his uh, the whole thing was just now we've entered into the time of restoration of re- restoring all things that you've been lo- that's been lost or stolen, and I'm going Hallelujah! Everybody's listening to my sermons. It's it's, <laughs> it's it's good for him to listen to my sermons. Uh, so, uh, but but the Holy Spirit spoke that to me, um, probably because uh, January second is when uh, Pastor Lisa and, and Pastor Mike and myself all spoke on what, what God was revealing to us about this year. And um, you know, one of the no, I'll sa- I'll save that hopefully. Um, but but he but he spoke to so it would have been the end of 2021 where he spoke to me and he said, um, you guys have entered into a time of restoration of all things. You're re, I'm restoring to you the years that the locusts have eaten, and um, and and there's a twofold excitement about that. The first full excitement is that most of us in this room have lost a lot recently, um, it, and again recently might be um, one year, two years, could be five years. Uh, but there's been a lot stolen from us. There's been a lot taken from us. Uh, we recognize that um, m- many of our loved ones uh, that that have that have gone that have been stolen from us, uh, we'll see again. And 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 though they've been stolen, uh, they have been <laughs> they have been deposited into a place that we will see them again. Uh, it, it's kind of like you know. Uh, when you, when you were a little bit younger and you got you got Uncle Sam withdrew money from your paycheck, you knew it was a sad day at that point, but you knew next year you're going to see that amount again, and so it's kind of sad. So so we do have that coming, but but so many of them their lives were st- were stolen from us too early, and and, uh, and even though they're secure, uh, they were stolen. But the Holy Spirit is saying. That no, even though they've been taken from you, um, it is time for restoration. And and um, <clears throat> and so even though we're we're dealing, I, I was I was heading somewhere and I got uh, dealing a little bit with that, but that's okay. Um, but we, we uh, oh, the twofold thing is that I'm excited because that means that in the here and the now, and, and I believe this year that we're going to work with God and we're going to correspond with God and 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 and, and um, operate with God in order to move into that place of getting some stuff back. And again, I've made this very clear that when, when, we, talk, when we talk with Job, I don't know, because God said that he, re, that he restored double in Job's, Job's, uh, Job's life uh, when, when he uh, turned and prayed for his friends, that he turned double. And again, I don't know how. I don't know how God's going to restore um, some, some, you know, some of those loved ones that have been taken from us. Um, because again, I don't think the restoration is that they're going to come back. They're going to hear knocking on the casket or anything on that order. I don't understand it. I don't get it. But apparently for Job, he got he had some more children. But somehow in that restoration, God restored the kids that he lost. And I don't understand it all, but I don't have to understand it. I just have to believe God for it. So that's the first part that's really exciting to me is that is that is that we have that that, that promise that in in these next what is it uh, eleven months now uh, that restoration that we're, we're working with God towards restoration that's exciting. But the second part of that that's really exciting is what we see here in Joel chapter two. Um, I could have been going to where I was going, but. Uh, 20, where are we at, John? Go to 25. Yeah, 
you know, 25. And it says, and I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Now again, here's the exciting part of that is that, that doesn't, that's just not um, sitting in a, in a chapter and he's going, you know, hey, you know, the, God is good and his mercy endures forever. Great is thy faithfulness. And, oh, by the way, I will restore to you the least. And then, and then, and then, and then it just, it's not just stuck in the middle of some chapter that is unrelated. It's smack dab in the middle and towards the end of a chapter that says, that says I'm raising up an army that the likes of it have never been seen. It's a strong army. It's a mighty army. And that army's, and then he's, he keeps going, talk, going on. And then just after this, go, go to 27, I believe it is. Just, 20, just after this. And you shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and I'm the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. 28. And it shall come to pass. The very next thing after the restoration of all things. The very next thing, the, the rest of it, this is a timeline. This is a pattern of the end times. The next thing that, that's on the list after, a rest, after restoration of the body of Christ and restoration of the things that have been stolen is the end time move of God. And, we, and beloved, we, as much as we'd like to take it out of order, and again, I'm not... I'm pursuing God. I want God. I want God to just interrupt our worship services. I want God to, to get us caught up where tears are flowing and, 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 and we're just, and we're uh, over, overwhelmed by who He is. I want that every service. I want it all the time to where we're just caught up in Him. But beloved, I'm telling you what, that, that this is a very important time period in the, in the body of Christ. It is a time period of the restoration of God restoring things so that the church can have all the gold. The church can have all the money. The church can... Uh, can uh, um, oh, think about this. Remember a couple of weeks ago when I closed my message by explaining to, to you about um, how the enemy... Uh, we're, we're plundering the enemy. And I picked out seven of you. And said, if one of you calls in the harv, uh, says, you know, he's stolen from all seven of you, and one of you goes, no, I've caught him, I want him to report to, and so he he gives you back seven times. What's the next person going to get? Because he's just gotten all seven. Well, we understand that all the way through um, history, he is stolen, and so that he's got a lot of stuff that's not his. But the Holy Spirit revealed this to me that day that I, uh, th- 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 that week after I, I, I was meditating on that, and he said. He said, that's where the wealth of the sinner being turned over to the hands of the just is a thing. Because the wealth of the sinner, he's not going to have it. But those that are yielded to his system do will. And so all of their stuff is going to end up coming into our hands in this season of restoration. There are going to be major corporations... And I, I, I'm saying that I started saying this before I even thought about not saying it. So I'll have to finish. There will be major corporations in this next year that will belly flop and will fail and will lose it all. There will be billionaires who turn into hundredaires overnight because the wealth of the wicked has no chance but to come into the house, hands of the just. And 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 again. That's what, and then, and then, and then, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Hallelujah. So, so we got to, beloved, this, some people can sit there and go, well, I'm not going to believe for the restoration because I just need to move on with my life. And I just need to, you know, keep thinking and, and believe in God for what, you know, uh, what's ahead of me. I'm not, okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Day. And, and so I'm not going to look behind me. I'm just going to keep moving forward. I'm going to keep, and I'm not going to believe for that because I got, no, we need to sit there and believe for restoration. We need to, we need to wake up every morning with an anticipation in our hearts about restoration, about where we're going. Because beloved, that is a essential mark in the timetable of God in this end times. And we've got to believe that. We've got to get excited about that. Now, so, 
uh, along with this, and again, I, I've said this every week, but I think I think it goes in. We, we've got to. I've always I've tried every year to try to get the right words to say this. Because how many times have I ever said things like God, God's, you know, God has this for this year, but we've got to work with and we've got to, we've got to do our part. And, and I just, and I just like what Bill Johnson says. Um, sometimes for us people, he says things in a way that, that we go, oh, that's what I've been trying to say. But he said, we've been given an invitation to cooperate with God towards, um, how was his, not restoring. Uh, recovering all things. His word was covered, but then he used restoration, uh, the whole sermon. We have been invited to cooperate with God and to work hand in hand with God towards restoration. So this year, though it'll be a year of restoration, there's going to be a lot of people that are not, have, don't, don't have restored because they've waited for God to do it and not worked with him. They've sat back and they've been passive about it. And God said, no, I want you to be active about it. And so in in developing this message in this series, the Holy Spirit has spent much time on me on just re- and it wasn't it wasn't like I had because I mean, I literally had the list in a second because uh, he, he it was that clear cut on, on the points. Um, but every week. <laughs> I told Pastor Lisa, I said, I've got so, I, I'm, I'm running on a backlog of sermons. I've got so many things that I want to preach. Um, <laughs> I mean, so many things. And, and here, I can't, get, I can't get through this series. I've had five points to get through, and every message is just, is to, every, every point is a message. And, and uh, I, I was getting frustrated, and I thought, hold it. These next two... I think I'll be able to get through real easy in one sermon. So next week I can get on to some you know, new stuff. And so I, I got my iPad out, my laptop, and I'm just here working on things and I'm going through and God's revealing stuff to me and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, one more week. We'll do one more week and get through all five of them because I ain't no way I'm getting through this one point. And I don't want to shortchange next week. I mean, during worship or during, during worship, during, during offering teaching, the Lord gave me a point towards that. And that, that I'm going, okay, he hasn't fully developed that last point yet. So we're, we're going to get in here. But we're gonna, we're, we're, the Holy Spirit is showing us how we cooperate with God, how we work with him towards restoration. Now, the first thing that he dealt with us is, that, is, is out of Acts 3, 19, which we don't have to turn there, uh, where it says, um, times of refreshing come in the presence of the Lord. And specifically the refreshing is talking about the restitution of all things. And, and, and so, so the first thing that we've got to understand, if we're going to work in, in, in correspondence with God towards restoration, is we're going to have to value His presence more. We're going to have to the Holy Spirit was uh, during praise and worship. I don't think I said anything of it, but he said, I'm calling my people gr- into greater and deeper praise and worship, not just in service. Yes, it will be an overflow of the service, but in your daily walk, in your daily life. He said, he said to the people that are hungry after me, they will find themselves at times, whether it be in their car, whether it be in their uh, in their house, whether it be whatever, and they're just they're, they're just they're just kind of they're maybe making dinner. Now I'm, I'm adding a little bit more to the to the de- to, to the simpleness of what he said, but they're going to find themselves in just the process of every day being overtaken by all that God is and just not able to communicate it. Anymore, because again, the presence of God is so important to them, and th- that when He moves on them, it's kind of like, okay, honey, come in here and stir the beans. I've got, I've got to sit down and just let my tears flow, let let the let my worship flow. In other words, praise and worship is going to become that essential. Now, here's the cool part: is that what you're doing at home will have an overflow at church. A lot of times people hope the, the church will have an overflow at home 
and it will at levels. But a lot of times when you come here, <laughs> Pastor Thad, just pay, pay, mind your own business, Pastor Thad. A lot of times when you come to church and you feel like it's really dry and it wasn't a whole lot going on at church, it's an overflow of what was leading up to that. You woke up this morning late and we're just rushing and you're like, oh, I gotta get there. And then and, the, and your wife was even going slower than you. And so you're like, you gotta get going because we gotta get to church. And then you smacked her around. No, you didn't smack her around again. You just said, come on, we gotta get to church. And, and but I've gotta get my makeup on. You can do it in the car, but, but I've gotta, I, I've gotta let the dog out. But you can do that when you get home. We'll clean up the mess. I'll clean up the mess if you, you know, no, I've gotta, you know, and, 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 and you're, and you're so rushed, you forgot the intimacy of the presence of God. And then you get to church and you're like, all right, um, all right. And, and you're trying to get into your the music and you're trying to praise the Lord and you know, all kinds of stuff. And he's like, it ain't working. Pastor Thad's off today. No, no. It's, it's an overflow of what you brought with you. Now, that doesn't mean you have to wake up at six o'clock on Sunday morning to make sure that we have a good service. It wouldn't hurt. But but again, when you get so when you get so overfilled with stuff during the week and stuff during your life that you don't learn to prioritize the presence of God. Don't don't think for a second that all of a sudden it becomes the pastor's job to usurp and to overpower everything that you put into your life that week. I'll get you a good go. I'll get you a good going. Was that right English? I'll get you going right. But what are you going to do when you get back home? Are you going to get upset your wife because, you know, I didn't feel like cleaning up the dog mess. I know I said I would, but you can do it. I have to go to the bathroom, you know. I just had La <laughs> I got to go to the bathroom, right? And then you, it starts over again. Your, your, your busyness and your stuff. I got to go do this. I got to go do this. I got I to fill my life up with stuff and not the presence of God. That's how they work in tandem. I'll get you going, but what do you do with it after that? If you do something with it after that, then you come back on Wednesday night and we've increased. And then we get going again. And then you go out and you increase. And then eventually it's just out of control. Or finally in control. God's control. But if we're going to move into restoration, we've got to understand the value of just the presence of God. Just spending time with Him. Loving on Him. Waking up in the morning with an expectation of Him being with you all day long. Honoring Him with the things that we see, the things that we say, the things that we do. Honoring Him with our money. Well, there went Pastor Thad down that trail. We're not going to go do that. <laughs> honoring God with our money. Honoring God with our stuff. Our, 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 our talents. Hallelujah. But when we get to that point, that's when we connect ourselves with that restoration. But see, here's the cool part. Psalms tells us in His presence is fullness of joy. And we just read in Joel where there's a restoration coming, but, the re but it starts with the word and. So it's connected to something before that. And the thing before that says, you're going to be glad and rejoice. My people will be glad and rejoice, and I'll restore to them the years of the locusts have eaten. In His presence is fullness of joy. So you need to get in His presence so your joy increases, and when your joy increases, that leads to restoration. Listen. Oh, Pastor Thad, why do you do this to yourself? If you are in depression and heaviness of heart, There is probably, I'll say it like this, there's probably a good chance that you've not been spending time in his presence. Because in his presence is fullness of joy. I think I said that merciful enough to, to not just throw you under the bus and back up over you. Um, there's probably a good chance that you are, your focus 
is on the problem and not on the promise keeper. Because in his presence, you'll increase joy. And when you increase joy, it is an, it, it is a, it is an intimate connection to restoration in your life. Now that led us to next, or the next point that we talked about last week. And, and again, you say, how did that lead us to it? Well, we talked about David strengthening himself, then inquiring and obeying. There's a lot of people who inquire and don't obey because they didn't strengthen themselves. Well, Pastor Thad, in that, in that story in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, it says that, that David um, uh, strengthened himself uh, in the Lord, but it doesn't tell us how he did it. Well, I can tell you how to strengthen yourself in the Lord. First of all, I preached a series on it not too long ago. That's first thing, so that, that would help you. But I'll tell you this right here. This is going to strengthen you. Get in his presence, increase your joy, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Get in his presence, get in joy, and then inquire. See how it flowed? I told you, I wish I could have preached those three sermons together, because they would, they would have just hit right on there. Get in his presence, get some joy, and then inquire the Lord. And then when you inquire the Lord, you're not beat up. You're, not, you're like, okay, we will pursue, we will overtake, and we will restore. All. Now, I'm not going to spend much more time on that. Um, but beloved, we've got to learn to inquire the Lord. We've got to learn to ask Him what we need to do. Um. Uh, man, that was, that was good too. Um, but one of the things I want to, I want to just deal with before I move on, because I didn't get to it. And again, sometimes I don't get to things because I, um, I just ran out of time and I'm like, I, I, that's good. I, I will finish here. Um, but when you're inquiring of the Lord, there's one of three ways the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And I know you, know, you guys know this, but that's okay because I want you to hear it time and time again. Because some of us still feel like, Lord, talk to me. And then, and then you're just not in a position. Maybe you're not strong enough to hear. And that's why he, that's why he has one way that tells you that, that, that it even bypasses your spirit. Okay, it comes in through your ears, not through your spirit. The word of God comes through your eyes or, or, or through your ears, but it comes through your eyes and then it, then it comes in your spirit. And that's pretty effective. The spirit of the Lord just comes straightly to your spirit. And that still small voice that he talks to you. And that's where most people, when they say, I can't, I don't really know, I'm inquiring of him, but I'm not hearing anything. And that's why the Holy Spirit gives you a man or a woman of God, people in your life that you can trust, that you go, I don't know what to do. And they go, well, let me help you on that. And again, here's the thing, is that when it comes through the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord will never contradict the Word of the Lord, ever. But the Spirit of the Lord, I've had people tell me the weirdest things that the Spirit of the Lord told them to do. And, I just, and I'll just stand there, I'll just stand there and I'll look at them and I'll go, that doesn't sound like the Spirit of the Lord to me. And they go, I don't care. I and one person said, I don't care what it sounds like to you. That's what he told me. I said, but that doesn't sound like the Spirit of the Lord. I didn't, I didn't need any other argument because it doesn't match the word. Well, I don't care what you think. I don't care what your opinion is, Pastor. It's not my opinion. The Spirit of the Lord will never tell you to do something that the word of the Lord tells you not to do, ever. It says in the word that he has said his word above his name. His word is the highest level of authority in, that is in existence. That's why when Jesus spoke, who was the word, a fig tree had no, had no choice but to die. When Jesus spoke, which was the word, demonic activity had no choice but to stop. Because the word is above everything. And so, so if, you, if you get this 
thing in their spirit that says, the Lord told me not to tithe and to spend all my money, spend all my money on, on catching up bills. I'm going to tell you that wasn't the Lord. That wasn't the spirit of God. That was, it. That was, a, that was rich little disguising his voice as God, and you got fooled. You guys know who Rich Little is? Most of y'all in this room, he, he, he did impersonations. And uh, I guess he was a different time period, wasn't he? I haven't heard anything from him. Um, but you, you've been fooled. And therefore, you're finding yourself further from your restoration than you were to start with. Now, here's the point that I, I had at the end of here is that a lot of people, well, I, I've just said this. I want to bring that other point out. A lot of people get counsel from people who say, well, it would only make sense. Pastor Mike has talked a lot in, in, in his offering teachings about how much counsel he got when he was just starting to learn to tithe. And all the counsel was, you can't afford to tithe. That doesn't make sense. But see, that counsel, no matter how well-meaning it was, was counsel from hell. You say, oh, but some of those people were probably Christians. Maybe they could have been. Because I know a lot of Christians who are like, no, I understand your situation. And you probably should hold back on your tithe. And they can mean well. Listen. Listen. Do you guys understand that one of the hardest things that Pastor Thad has to do in his ministry? There's a lot of stuff. I don't like Januaries. Januaries are a bunch of are, are filled with a bunch of stuff that I did not go to Bible school to do. Taxes. I gotta do W my W twos, and I gotta turn this thing in and do that thing and get all the giving records ready. And I didn't go to school for that. I don't want to do that. I don't like doing that, but I gotta do that. And um, and there and <laughs> I was talking about people doing things that they didn't want to do, and and people can well-meaning. <laughs> I don't know why I brought up January. I guess I just wanted to complain a second. So glad you guys listened to me. Um, let me go back over here because this is where I started talking about it. Um, but the, but the the basic one I was trying to make before I got real confused for a second. Is is that is that there there pe- people want to say it's it's oh no it's it's understandable that you don't do that we oh 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 here's what I was going to say the hard I don't like doing that because and that's one of the hardest things I had to do I had to learn to do it and I hate doing it but 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 the hardest thing that I have to do in my life. And this may not sound good to you, some of y'all. Is is accept seed from some of your hands? Because I know that your financial situation is probably a little more, you know, frustrating than mine. That might be. I mean, I've I've gone through it. Don't get me wrong on that. And so when you put money in my hands. I'm sitting there thinking, listen, I know that they could do something with this $20, $30, $40 more than I could do with this $20, $30, But I understand something. I don't have a right to tell you to do something contrary to what the Word tells you to do. And the Word of God tells you to, to sow to, give to those that deliver the Word to you. And then it talks about whatsoever things you sow is what you're going to reap. So if I were to go to you and say, hey, look here, you know, sister, I don't know who you might be. I know you're going to hard times. You keep that money. You keep that money. I have disobeyed God. I have stopped the flow of blessing to her. And I, and I have led her to a place of, of, of where restoration can't happen for her. Because I thought I knew better. 
And so I simply have it written down here, and I'm not going to read it because I, I, I slow. If you get somebody who is counseling you or teaching you to do something that is contrary to the Word of God, then, beloved, don't walk away from them, run away from them. Don't hold on to them simply because they're, they're telling you to do something that, that tickles your ears. Oh, but that's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> well, I, was, I just had that somebody that, that that people who surround themselves with yes men because they just they don't want to be told what's right. They just want to be told that hey, that, just do that. And so, so if dude. I was going to, every name that came to my mind is somebody that we all know. So I was like, I don't want to use that. No, I can't use that name. So I'll say, dude, is like, I'm a little short of money this week. And I could use, sure use that $100 tithe check to eat out and to eat by some groceries. I could, I could really use that. But I know if I ask Pastor Thad, he's going to tell me to do something that I don't want to do. He's not gonna. He's not gonna have mercy on me, which is totally wrong. Because Pastor, Th if you ask some other people in this church, they'll go, "You dumb, thinking you shouldn't do that." And Pastor Thad will say, "Listen, I get it." Has anybody ever had that conversation with me that I've answered you like this? I get it. I get your situation. I've been in that situation, and I know that I've got to obey God instead of obeying man. I got to obey God instead of obeying my circumstances. And so that's all I can tell you. <laughs> and so you received a heavy, huge dose of mercy. But again, they won't come to Pastor Thad because he will lead them that way. And so they might go to somebody that, uh, that they, I'm going to go to my next door neighbor who's Christian and I'm going to talk to her. She does, do you, oh, 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 I'm not going to turn there. But do you remember the scripture in your Bible where it says, yield to the voice of your next door neighbor because they have to answer for your soul? You remember that scripture in Hebrews? It's a very meaningful scripture. It doesn't exist. That must be one in Hezekiah, right? The book of Hezekiah. Because it ain't in the Bible. The Bible says, obey those that rule over you in other words, your pastors, your leaders, because they have to answer for your soul. And so if you come to me and I'm, go I'm going like, yeah, go ahead and disobey the Bible. Go ahead. And then one day I get up there and, and God looks at me and goes, okay, how come Pastor Lisa didn't prosper the way she wanted and she wouldn't tithe? Um... I don't know. It must have been the devil. Well, let me, let me show you something uh, that you said to her. Where she said uh, that, where you told her it was okay that she didn't tithe. But other times I said she should. Yeah, but you gave her a license to. You answered her. You got to answer for this. I don't know how, I don't know. I don't know the, the details of what's going to go on. I know this, that Hebrews tells us that I have to answer. So I'm going to give you the answer, whether you like it or not. And what you do with it is exactly what God gave me that revelation. And I'm so glad he did when Elijah looked at Elisha and said, what do I have to do with thee? And walked away. I've been obedient. I've, I've told you to come and follow me. I, I, I've, I've been obedient to what I've said to you. If you want to obey it, cool. If you don't want to obey it, that's up to you. I've done my part. I've been faithful. So don't, don't get into that mess of, of just keep asking until you find someone you agree with, that agrees with what you want them to say. Honor the three ways the Holy Spirit speaks to you. But they all must line up with the Word of God. Now, I'm going to move on to number four, which I've left myself plenty of time to do. <clears throat> because we've gotten, 
value his presence. We've gotten rejoice, be glad and rejoice. We've gotten um, inquire and obey. The fourth area, um, and I'm, I'm tying two into one because I believe they both flow together. And, and number four is just simply going to be quit looking back and start expecting restoration. One of the greatest areas of error in the body of Christ is to keep looking back at what used to be. How many of, again, what came to my mind right there was um, how many, the good old days. Remember the good old days when we had revival meetings and we'd stay up all night and we'd do all that kind of stuff? And I'm like, you good old days. Amen. I didn't mind late services. I grew up, you know, we grew up in having big old Holy Ghost throwdowns and uh, John Wesley Fletcher being there preaching services and then having an hour and a half altar time where you literally saw people who were deaf hear and were mute talk and were blind saw. I mean, we, we, you didn't want to miss a service. It was, it was some powerful times. Yeah, I get that. But so often we can look, keep looking back and saying, but what, remember the good old days. Remember what I used to have. But see, God, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness or were in bondage, they would always think back to what they used to have before they were in bondage. Of course, after 420 years, everybody that was there had lived in bondage all their life. So they just had stories of what it used to be like. And so they complained. And then God moved on them because he said, I want, I want to bring you, I want to restore to you. I want to give you the land that I've had for you since your, since father Abraham with his many sons, many sons had father Abraham. All right. <laughs> I want to restore that land. I want to restore land to you that, that I had, I'd made for you. And so he, he, he got them out. And again, we, we've already talked about that. And from the second they got out of Egypt, they couldn't stop looking back. Go, go, to, go to Exodus chapter 14. I mean, this is literally but a, a, a couple days, if, if, if a couple days, after they left Egypt. Um... Start verse 10. <clears throat> and when Pharaoh drew nigh. Okay, so, so now you know the story. They, they, they've just plundered Egypt. Um, and, and Egypt had taken all their stuff off for 425, 30 years of, of slavery. They'd taken all their stuff. In one night's time, the blood over their house um, God said, okay, I want you to stand there. And then after the death angel had passed over their house, he said, okay, I want you to go and demand all the goods that they've taken from you. They had restoration in one night. And God said, all right, now leave, follow Moses. So he follows. So now, so Pharaoh is standing in his palace, standing at his castle, overlooking his land. And he's watching a million to three million people leave his land with all the wealth of that land. And his first thought is, good riddance. And then as they get out of sight, as, they, as he's walking, he's watching, and he's getting out of sight, and he wakes up the next morning, and he starts thinking, hold it a second. They got all our stuff. They got all our stuff. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? They got all our stuff. So he calls in his men, and, he, and, and they come into a, a meeting, and they're like, what should we do? And, he, and they, they go, let's go after them, because they got all our stuff. And so he gets his army put together. Get, and so in that process, they're moving. They get to the Red Sea. And they're, stand, and, and, and they're going, what do we do? You know, it's, it's, the, the water is really full. And, and we can't get around. If we go down that way, uh, it's going to take too many days journey. We go down that way. We're gonna, we can't go north. Uh, is it the Mediterranean Sea or whatever? Is it? There's a sea up there. Where, where do we go? What do we do? And all of a sudden, they look back and they see this cloud of dust coming behind them. And they realize they can't move with, with 
with two million farmers and bricklayers, they can't move south because they're just going to catch up with them. What are we going to do? And in verse 10 it says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Can can I ask you a question? (coughs) Is it unreasonable that fear rose up inside of them? Honestly, it's not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable to look at your circumstances and have fear come at you. But that should be a sign to you that he who has brought me this far is faithful to complete it. This was, that wasn't their problem. It wasn't their problem to cry out. Say, Lord, Moses, I need help. But notice what they did in verse 11. And they said unto Moses, instead of just saying, we need help, help, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, help us. Instead of crying out, they cried out, because there were no graves in Egypt, you've taken us away to die in the wilderness. Wherefore hast thou dealt this unto, with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? Liars. Leave us alone that we may serve Egyptians. Liars. For it had been better. (laughs) It had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we die in the wilderness. Not one of them said that to them. Oh no, we're good serving the Egyptians. They were excited as anybody to get out of there. I mean, liar, liar, pants on fire. So they get out. They're no more out of there. They have no more than walked some miles. I'm sure I could have figured out exact mileage, but, you know, I don't know. A day or two's journey. So we know maybe 15 miles. They turn around. They're at the Red Sea. They turn around, and they're like, remember Egypt? Remember when we didn't have to worry about armies coming after us in Egypt? Remember that time? Now listen, God had mercy on them. Anybody in here glad for God's mercy? I've told this story so many times. This is story number 56, I think. But Jesse and I left. We got married in June of 95. In August of 95, we came over to be youth pastors at Grace Fellowship in Lexington under Dad. And um, we came in at a real exciting, beautiful, prosperous time in Grace Ministries history, uh, the Continental Inn. Um, They did the most merciful thing they could have done to the Continental Inn a couple years ago and tore it down. Um, and they probably were a couple years late on that. <laughs> and so the, the, the adults had this, the big uh, room. They had a big conference room. And they had everything set up. It, it, it was a good setup. The kids had three. It was three of their meeting halls. And... I mean, they had big, big, nice size meeting halls for the kids and their thing. And every Wednesday night, the youth group got a closet. And I'm really not, I'm not, it basically, I, I don't know. If I'm thinking 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, maybe 12, maybe 12 by 24 something like that. It was it was a small little just in a, a little area that they they had in there and it was it was small but we put as many chairs in there good and I was like I don't care. I'm you know I'm I'm out of the denomination and I'm in here and we'd set that up and we'd get a sound system that was makeshift but we'd get it and, I, and we'd sing songs and we'd have worship and we'd have a good time in there and, and all that kind of stuff. And um 
and often Jesse and I we'd go to we'd go to the conference hall where they had a little closet that we got to keep all our and we'd we'd take our little cart which we usually had to hunt down a cart. We'd get there like at six o'clock and have to walk around the uh, the building to try to find a cart that wasn't being used. And we'd take the cart and and roll all of our stuff in there and then set it up and make sure everything was set up. And often we'd go find our cart and go over there and get it set up. And the, and the doors were locked, so then we'd have to walk around and find other people to to find find let us in. So they'd find let us in, and we'd set up and we'd get everything done. And when we were done with that night, we'd have to load everything up and take it back over there. And that's okay because everybody's doing it. That's, that's cool. Well, finally it came. The end of November. And I go hauling our cart over after finding the cart and find, loading it all up. Haul, and I look. And they had just that week decorated for Christmas. And they put all of their storage boxes in the youth room. It was to the top with empty boxes. And the reason I'm standing here like this is because this is how I stood. I'd spent my afternoon getting worship ready. I'd spent my afternoon getting my word ready. And I looked over at Jessica. And I said, I didn't have to put up with this in Georgetown. I knew I had a room for me to minister in. I didn't have to put the, up with this in Georgetown. This is unacceptable. And I was, I was, to say I was angry would be making angry people look nice. I was beyond angry. Because I had an anointing I needed. I really don't want to shortchange the preparation I put into that night. Um, but I had something I was going to suppose, and I was, I mean, I was beyond angry. And, and I was like, all right, you stay here with this. I'll go find Pastor Jim to see uh, if there's another room. Because we're not going to squeeze on in there. You can fit three or four more people in there, I think. So I was walking out, and Jessica stayed with the stuff, and I was walking out. And I heard this voice. And he said, so you want to go back to Egypt, eh? And all of a sudden, the, the flashbacks. See, when I stand in there looking at this room, I, 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 I could only think about the fact that I always had, I, could, I had my upstairs in that church. It was set up. It was my, it was my area. It was mine. I, I do what I want in there. I, that's all I could see. I couldn't see all the hassle they'd given me for, for, for four years, six years, all the things that I had to deal with. I, I didn't, I didn't see all that kind of stuff. I was just looking back in this romantic view of, of the fact that I always had a room. And when I walked away and he said, so you want to go back to Egypt? I just stopped. I said, I'm sorry. Now, it didn't make it any easier because, again, I, I don't think we got to meet that night because we, there was no place for us to meet. So we just had to go into the big people church. The next week, I think they had it cleaned out or something like that. They, we, we had a room next week. But, I, but man, that, that hit me so hard. That if I'm wanting to go where God wants me to go, if I'm busy looking at just the romanticizing the things of my past, I'll never go there. And the first thing that comes out of the, the Israelites' mouth at, at the Red Sea is, oh, we didn't have to worry about getting killed in, in Egypt. You always had to get worried about getting killed. You were slaves. And then, and then just... They get across. God does this magnificent thing that literally um, <laughs> you know, Moses puts his hand out over the water goes back. Um, they walk across on muddy land. Yeah, I mean it was completely dry. 
Listen, I've got a backyard that all, all, all winter long with the snow and the rain and then the spring where it rains a lot, it usually takes until either late, late spring or early summer before our, we have an area that's just a swamp because it just holds water. This is a, this is a sea. This is a sea that is, that is deep. And, okay, God pushes back the waters. That's cool enough. But the fact that that wind that blows, that pulls back the waters, also completely dried the muddy ground. So they didn't get their sandals muddy. That meant a lot to God. And God does this. They get on the other side, and, and they look back across, and they watch how, how close were they getting? We don't know, but they all got in the water. And the waters just go crushed down on them and totally drowned a whole army of Egyptians. And they're there celebrating and they're having a good time and all that kind of stuff. And then a short time later, in, in Exodus 16, they get hungry. They haven't had any food for a day or two, or a couple days. Verse 3, And the children of Israel said unto him, Would to God that we had died in the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by flesh pots, and we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth in this wilderness to starve. Re remember? Remember when we got to eat whenever we wanted to back in Egypt? Remember? Remember those good times? Remember the good times where we'd sit and we'd eat whenever we wanted to? They're looking back. Listen, you cannot move to where God has for you to go if you keep looking back. It is an impossible task. Your, 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 your car seats face forwards, not backwards, because what's behind you don't matter no more. You've got some restoration and some ground to take ahead of you. Amen. And as long as you're looking behind, you'll never get to... Don't say never, Pastor Thad. That's not good grammar. You will never get to where you're going if you keep looking back. Amen. What's back there? You're going to run into something in front of you. So God provides manna. So they move on a little further and they get thirsty. Different battle. Same result. Verse 3. 17 verse 3. And the people thirsted there for water and the people murmured against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt? To kill us with thirst? They, they, couldn't, they couldn't figure it out. See, their, their pattern was pattern of operation was looking back, constantly looking back. God wanted to get their eyes on the land. Think about it. I'm not going to, we're going to get there in a second. Numbers chapter 13. God said, all right, 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 all right. <laughs> all right. There's been nine times. There's been nine times that, 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 that I've, I've tried to get you going somewhere you need to go. And nine times you keep looking back. I need you to quit looking back. I need you to start looking forward. So he said, I got a plan. I'm going to take 12 gentlemen from different tribes, and I'm going to have them work together. I'm going to have them get going in there so that you can actually get a picture of how good the land is. I want you to want to get into the land. I want you to want what's ahead of you. I want you to get excited. I want you to operate in full expectation with what's ahead of you. I want you to lay aside the things that are behind you. Yes, yes, you may have had extra free time when you didn't have to come to church on Sunday morning. Yes, your Wednesday nights may have been a little bit more where you could just sleep and go to bed early when you didn't have to come to church. Yes, there was maybe less for you to do when you, when you were a heathen. I get, yes, there may have been. But where I'm taking you, you're going to be glad you participated. Yes, you may have had that extra $50. Yes, you 
may have had that extra $100 before you started tithing. But where I'm taking you, that $50 or that $100 is not going to matter. I want you to just get your mind off of those flesh pots. I want you to get your minds off of the fact that you had a little river running down the middle of your property. And I want you to get your eyes on the restoration that I have in store for you. So he sent those men in. And ten of them came back and goes, Oh, let me tell you, if you think we've had it hard so far. And two of them got the picture. Caleb and Joshua got the expectation. And they couldn't wait. They said, yeah, yeah, there's some big guys in there. Yeah, there's some giants in the land. But if God said this is what we're supposed to have, then we are well able to overtake it. We are well able to move into this land. But, 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 but. It's bigger than, than the Egyptian armies that we faced coming out of Egypt. But, 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 but. They made us feel little and significant. But, 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 but. And they had all the excuses. Two of them couldn't get it out of their eyes. My son... I think and my wife's fiance have done a lot of my soon to be son yeah have uh, have done a lot of research over several of the national parks my my wife bought my son over christmas a picture book is is huge it wasn't just like a coloring book or anything yeah of all of the state parks with their pictures, you know, photographs. And Ryan hangs out with it all the time. And he keeps saying, we've got to take a trip. We've got to go. We've got to plan this. And I think, haven't, Taylor, haven't you been talking with him about that kind of stuff too? We've got to take a trip. We've got to go out there. We've got to see this. Because they got the pictures. They've seen the pictures. They haven't been there yet. Now they were there, but they had that they had the vision. And now they really want to go. They keep trying to plan. They keep trying to think about how they can get out there. And I have no doubt that they'll make it out there eventually. Forty years. Jacob, uh, Joshua and Caleb had to hold on to that picture. But that picture, that that picture directed their next step. That picture directed their next statements that came off their mouths. We're not going to complain. That picture directed their actions. So that when the time came, They got to step into that picture. But you'll never get that picture if you keep looking behind you. Go over to um, Mark 4 real quick. For 40 years they walked in circles. Most of them never saw restoration because they couldn't get what was behind them out of their heads. There's some there's some of us in this room that you've argued with God about your giftings and callings. Not because you think God doesn't know what he's doing, but because of your yesterdays. But God, remember when I? But God, what about this? And God's going... 
that doesn't matter. I've got a plan for you ahead of you. But notice here in Mark 4. It says, and these are they likewise. Verse 16. So again, when we're confronted with new battles, the enemy loves to remind us of old hurts and things that have been stolen from us, the failures of the past, the things in our past. And it's to stop us from moving forward. And it can be because nothing's changed. It can be something that, well, if it was working, why am I getting these new, bat- uh, these new battles? And the, and the reason I brought you to Mark 4 is because if you didn't have the new battles, then it wouldn't be working. The new battles come to, take, to stop your progress. Do you, not, do you not think that the enemy knew that new battles in the wilderness would get the children of Israel moping and complaining again and would slow down their progress? Mark, verse 16, Mark 4, 16. And this is the word which is sown on the stony ground. Who when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. Hey, we're going to move forward. We're going to get restoration and have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a time. And afterwards, when affliction and persecution arises for, to steal a word. So when the battle comes, that tells you it's working. Because the devil goes, the only way they can't achieve, the only way they can't grab a hold of what's ahead of them, the only way they can't step into, a, into, uh, uh, into restoration is if they lose what's, inside, what's in front of them. If I get them stuck in the past. So be encouraged. <laughs> I know that sounds weird. Be encouraged when the battle comes. Don't be encouraged because of the battle. Because God's giving you victory over the battle. When you see it, you go, ha, 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 ha. If I was going the wrong way, you would have put tulips and roses in front of me. And you would have brought Tiny Tim a tiptoe through the tulips. And you would, and, and you would, have, you would have let me skip and jump and twirl all the way to, to disaster. But the fact that you brought, dis, you brought a battle in my life tells me I'm doing something right. And so I'm going to keep doing something right. And I'm going to press towards the prize. But you know, but it doesn't stop there because it goes on and says, Some uh, of the word is sown among thorns, such as here is the word and the cares of this world. Take it. Seafulness of riches love. I just I got stuck on the cares of this world because again, we can we can fill ourselves. We got before us God. Restoration, increase, more than enough. And we've got all these distractions. You know what? You don't have to look all the way back there to get off track. You just have to look over here at this distraction. I'm not pointing at you, John. Over here at this distraction. Over here at this distraction. Over here at this distraction. All you have to do is this, and you'll find yourself drifting off course. Oh, I know I've got restoration ahead of me, but I've got all this busy stuff over here. I was listening to something this week and they talked about busyness. Just be, being busy, busy, busy. Yeah, those, those are things that the enemy puts in. He can't get you looking all the way back, so let me just look at you looking at the ditch. Do you understand? It won't take very long if you're looking at the ditch before your car ends up in the ditch. All right, let's see if I can wrap this up here. I already talked about that, but in Numbers 14, finally, the children of Israel murmured one more time. Verse 2, 14, 2. Children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation. Would God, this is a couple of years, this, this is quite a ways into it now. Would God have let us die in the land of Egypt instead of dying in the wilderness? They kicked, they kicked. 
God gave them 10 chances to finally say, hey, we've got a vision before us. After nine of them, he goes, hey, I'm going to give you a picture. They come back with a picture, and the picture wasn't enough. So God said, okay, all you guys, 20 years and young, you're going to die in the wilderness, and I'm going to take a fresh group in that never knew, that didn't know Egypt, didn't know, and all that stuff. I'm going, to, I'm going to train them, I'm going to work with them, and they're the ones I'm going to take into restoration. Listen, folks. We can stand around and we can hear about other people having restoration happen to them. Or we can start joining ourselves and cooperating with God, doing what we need to do and keep our eyes set on, on, set on forward and take it ourselves. We can either hear stories about it or we can participate. But are you going to look forward? Are you going to get that in your vision? What's been stolen from you? Of oh, just a lot. What? Oh, I've just uh, a lot. How will you know when you get it returned? Pastor, did I just say that? Steve, you're going to come to the guitar because, like, it'll at least be a perception that I'm done. I could probably get you someone else's. The blessing. What are you looking at getting restored? Again, I, I don't know any of us that knows what we could have given to us to restore some family members that have been taken from us. I, I really don't. God does. And what, what the Holy Spirit told me a couple of weeks ago is that when, when it comes, when it's restored, you'll know that it's like, this is that. Have you had an, an inheritance stolen from you? Have you had some finances stolen from you? A house? Cars? Children? Is it children? There's some people in here who they have some children that are not right with God that have been stolen. Maybe years, maybe marriages. Beloved, it's important that I think we kind of write down some stuff that we're believing for restoration so that we can keep our eyes set on forward on the promises of God. But, I mean, I'm not going to have you even turn here, but Luke chapter 9 verse 62 says, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Can't operate in the kingdom of God. If you're looking back, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of those that draw back unto perdition, but them that move on to the saving of the soul. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Brethren, I count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do forget those things that are behind and press reaching forth to those things that root for. I press towards the mark. I press towards Jesus, the word of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The expect quote from me. Your expectation of what lays ahead of you must make looking back seem dumb, like a dumb idea. You had you don't have full revelation of what's ahead of you if looking back and what's behind you seems like a good idea. One more point. I thought I was almost done and I don't. Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 12.1 Wherefore seeing we are encompassed about with such a great cloud of witness, let us, let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which so easily besets us so that we can run the race. Last week I told you I closed my message with a story of Allison and Bentley. And that same night, uh, Jesse and I were watching a Western. My dad would be proud. And it was a group of families that were trying to make their way from Texas to Oregon. And so, and they were people that were from, they were foreigners and they were trying to set up a new life in, in America. And, and uh, so they were trying to bring their old life and just set it up over here. And so they hired two guys to help them in, a, in their journey. And as they're, as they're, as they're going, they realize these guys are novices. They don't know, they don't know how to survive in the West, you know, in the deserts, in the mountains, all kinds of stuff. And they're just, they're, they're learning things all the time. And they get up to the first river they have to cross. And they're like, all right, how do we do it? It's deeper than we thought it was going to be. We thought it'd be a little lower at this time of the year. It's deeper. How how are we going to cross? And they said, well, we're going to have to make the wagons as light as we can. They got a plan. And so they went out there and they said, okay, okay, guys, listen. Um, You're going to have to unload things that you don't need. That Things that are not essential for life, you're going to have to unload. And they all and they all looked and they said, because this was their lives. This was the lives they brought from overseas. And they were like, no, we can't do that. We got. And, and one guy was a music. He, he made his life as a musician, and he had a full piano. And those pianos were. We think some of the pianos today were big. It was big box. He had a piano in the back of his wagon. The guy's like, man, I don't know how your horses have made it this far, because he had a piano. He had all these instruments back there, and he said, listen, you got to leave it. We're not going to be able to move forward with holding on to what you've had behind. And in one of the statements he made, he looked at them because they were they were crying. There's no, we don't want to let go. And he said, he said, you have three choices: unload and cross the river and keep moving, keep all your stuff and drown, or go back to Fort Worth and don't go where we're going. And I'm sitting there. He, God's just talk, been talking to me about Bentley and Allison. I've been wagging the tail, if you remember, the last week. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, where's my iPad at? Where's my, where's my Apple Pencil at? i got to write this down because, uh, because that will preach. And I knew where I was going to preach because I knew where I was going. And beloved, you have a choice to make. You can either hold on to the hurts, the memories, and the thoughts of your past. Maybe the good old days. Maybe the days before you fought, thought the devil was on your case. It was always been on your case. And you can either hold on to that kind of stuff. But it's going to end the current, the, the, the way you'll never make it to where we're going. You'll be taken out. We can go back to the old life, but there's never restoration there. There's just further memories. Or you can lay stuff down. Purpose. What's before me is far greater than it's anything behind me. restoration that God has in store for me is high more more valuable than holding on to the thoughts and the hurts and pains of my past. Amen? Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon Spirit has been talking to me a lot this week. And I, I, not necessarily anything I've done per se. It's not, it's not like he's trying to correct me. He's just talking to me about it. But a lot of times when 
you know, the talk of the tithe comes up. People say things like, but how can I tithe? I've not, I can't make it the way things are. I can't, I can't, I've got, I ain't got enough money not tithing. How can I tithe and expect to get by? And it's, it's a principle. It's doing things God's way, operating according to his word, listening to him, obeying him, therefore operating under his blessing. And it doesn't have to make sense. Because most of what God says doesn't make natural sense. He tells us that. He says, those professing to be smart are really fools. Because they're doing what they know to do. When you're doing what God tells you to do, you're the real smart one. So it doesn't have to make sense. Professing to be wise, they became fools. But we look at that and we say, based on where I'm at and what I've been, I can't afford to tithe. And then, and so you don't. And so guess what happens? You keep getting more of what you've had. Next month, you can't make it even more. And the next month, even more. And then you start getting mad at pastor because he keeps bringing up tithing. Pastor Mike, don't you be preaching on tithing anymore. Just talk about giving. Because I can give. I can give a dollar in the offering plate. I don't need to have you teaching on tithing. You start getting mad because your experience, the past, is keeping you from moving into the blessings. I don't have time for this. It doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. My favorite story of that is 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 a lady who started coming to our church. Who started coming to our church uh, years ago. She has since she's moved. She moved to Louisville or something like that. Um, And she uh, and she was on only money she could she made was uh, child support. That's all she had. She had to take care of her kids for a month on child support. And she she was tired. She just, she would go, she would have like a week or two left at the end of her month with no money. And all of a sudden, one day she goes, she goes, uh, she comes to our church. She starts learning about tithing. And she goes, as a kid, I was taught on tithing. As a kid, she was taught on tithing. And she quit doing it because she didn't have no money to do it. And she said, I heard you preach it. I know I was supposed to do it. So the first thing she did the next month that she got her, her child support, she brought her tithe check. And it was the hardest thing for her to do. But she said, I know that's what I'm supposed to do. And the end of that month came. The beginning of the next month came. And she brought her tithe check again. And she looked at me and she said, Pastor, you're never going to believe what happened. I said, try me. I'm a believer. And she goes, I didn't run out of money this month. I have money left over. So I'm giving it as an offering to the church. And she said, it doesn't make sense. Because I've spent more this month than I usually spend. I don't know how I have money left over. I said, can I insert an opinion here? She goes, oh, it's because I tithed. So that, that month was the month we were doing our construction over at that other church. And we had to try to figure out a way to buy drywall. And she goes, nothing's changed. She's got the same income. And she goes, she brought her tithe. And she goes, Pastor, can I buy the drywall? It was like $250 for the drywall we needed, something like that. And she goes, can I buy the drywall? Absolutely. Guess what? She had money left over at the end of the month. And nothing changed. 
How does that work? That's not my job. My job is to press towards the mark. My job is to press forward. My job is to keep on doing what God's called me to do. My my job is not to pull back under perdition, but to keep moving on to the saving of my soul. And God, it's God's job to confirm His Word with signs following. It's God's job to watch over His Word to perform it in our lives. That's His job. Our job is to obey. Our job is to move forward. And to move forward with an expectation. Beloved, restoration is ours. Restoration is coming. And so let's keep moving forward. I love you. Excuse me for a second. I gotta open up my notepad because I love you guys. God gave me a second point for next week. I love you. Let's move forward. Are you guys excited about where we're going? Good. Because it should make any place that we've been so far weak. I don't want to go back. I got good things ahead of me. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.